Living with a narcissist can be difficult for anyone, but growing up in the care of a narcissist can affect your life in some pretty surprising ways. For example, most narcissists use a really pervasive sort of manipulation tactic called gaslighting, and you probably already know that that's pretty much the worst kind of manipulation because it messes with your head in ways you might never expect, especially when it comes from a parent. This is especially true for the children of narcissistic mothers who unfortunately can't get away from it and have no concept of what normal actually looks like from the inside. Now, if your mother was a narcissist, you probably spent most of your childhood thinking you weren't good enough, and you probably also assumed that your mom was right about everything she said about you. You might have spent most of your childhood trying to get her approval, desperately seeking her validation, and always failing miserably. For me, and for many of us, this continued well into adulthood. Of course, many of us also actually internalize the toxic mother's image of ourselves, and often we do our best to attempt to become the person she wants us to be, even when that person isn't who we actually are. And of course, when that happens, we begin to fail, we start to think we're worthless. Like all narcissists, these women, they have two faces. The one they show the public, and the one they show you behind closed doors at home. And as you get older, on the phone or by email or whatever. And very few people outside your family will have any idea of what you're actually dealing with. Most people will either not be aware of her or they'll think she's amazing, like she hung the moon. This can really mess with you and your sense of self, to put it mildly. Worst of all, as the child of a narcissistic mother, you are forced to pretend in public that all is well, at least when you're still a kid, all the while knowing that when you get home, things are gonna be different. In some cases, you literally dread going home because the difference is so significant. I remember getting a stomach ache every day on the way home from school, stressing out about it. And if you're a little rebellious, you might not pretend all the time, and then people will start to ask questions. They won't get why you're not happy, and of course, they'll believe your narcissistic mother's lies when she tells them, there's just something not right about that kid, or whatever other excuse she happens to make. Alternatively, you'll spend your life living up to an impossible standard, pretty much trying to keep her happy. It never works, but you keep trying. Also, like other narcissists, she doesn't have the ability to tune into you emotionally, and unfortunately, she has no empathy, which is one of the most important things about being a mother, in my opinion. The concept of unconditional love is foreign to her, and she only loves conditionally. She makes sure you know it, too. She's critical and judgmental. Until you actually discover that there's such a thing as narcissism, you probably go around trying to fix yourself, don't you? Obviously, narcissists come in all shapes and sizes, race, culture, creed, religion. None of this is an issue. Nationality, what country they live in, how much money they make, across the board, narcissists come out. It has nothing to do with any of that stuff. It has to do with who they are as a person and often how they were raised by someone else. So how do you know if your parent is a narcissist? Well, let's jump right into the signs that you were raised by a narcissist. Number one, it would be fair to call you a people pleaser. You will bend over backwards to make someone happy, even if it means losing out yourself. And that might be because your narcissistic parent would trample all over you and maybe anyone else in your family to get what they want without really caring much about how anyone else felt in the situation, including you. This leads a lot of adult children to sort of do the opposite of that, to sort of overcorrect and sort of do the whole bending over backward thing to make everybody else happy. Maybe because they were raised by someone who constantly needed that from them, and maybe because they just watched that and they didn't like it. And on the same token, these same people were brought up being told their needs, their thoughts, their feelings, their beliefs didn't matter. And either way, people are now walking all over them simply because they don't even know what they need and they certainly don't know how to express it. They can't believe that they matter. They are trying really hard to do the opposite of what their parent did. And in doing that, they end up getting walked all over. I have to admit that that was me for a long time. And I still sometimes have those moments where I struggle to stand up for myself. See. When you grow up with a narcissistic parent, you're made to feel like there's something really wrong with you if you have normal needs. You're made to feel like you're crazy or sick if you have normal concerns about things. Selfish, small, useless if you don't become the thing they expect you to be. Often, you, you find yourself even sort of cowering when it comes to authority figures or anybody who seems like they have any kind of hold over you for the same reason because you grew up in a situation where the authority figure, your parent, or some other authority in your life, had the ability to smack you down and ruin your life in an instant, because that's how they needed it to be. For me, the best way to combat this 
was to learn as much as I could learn about this disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, and to learn how to identify those messages that I grew up with that weren't really my beliefs, my thoughts, my feelings, those messages that were dysfunctional, and then to actively start working against them. Now this brings me to number two. We're going to talk about your siblings at this point if you had any. If you didn't have siblings, maybe it was some other child or even an adult or in some cases a pet. Narcissistic parents have this way of playing you against against someone else in your life very often if you have your siblings, one of your siblings. I've talked before about the family that I knew that the mother had two daughters and each daughter was alternatively the golden child and the scapegoat. And this is common for narcissistic parents. They have trouble with personal boundaries. They view other people, including their children, and often especially their children as extensions of themselves, not as whole people. They require the most attention they require all of the praise, the supply, as it were. And what happens is the parent will pick one child or person to be the golden child. And that child will be lifted up. But in addition to getting all the praise and all the, all the positive attention from the parent, the child also is expected to be perfect and has no room for being human. The other child then is the scapegoat child, the one that gets all the blame, never does anything right, is constantly in trouble. And like I said, these roles can alternate between kids and families. And sadly enough, if the roles remain pretty consistent throughout their childhoods, you will experience kids who had two entirely different childhoods in the same house. Any of that sound familiar? Not only that, but you'll be incredibly competitive with your sibling, whether you want to or not. You will always feel like everything you do is being compared to that other sibling. And that's the case, especially for the scapegoat, but even for the golden child, because in some cases the scapegoat, you know, despite the abuse, often rises up above the golden child because the golden child has this really twisted idea of how good they really are. Or they have this sometimes rebellion against what they are. And so they kind of fall. Either way, you end up being compared to the other sibling if that's the case in your family. Any of that sound familiar? Now, if you happen to be the golden child in this equation, you might resent your sibling because they were under less pressure than you. But also, if you were the scapegoat child, you might resent your sibling because they got more attention and apparent love than you. Either way, you have to understand that your narcissistic parent probably intentionally put you up against each other, partially so that you couldn't be closer to one another than to them. It's all about serving their own needs. It has nothing to do with either of you, and it's not your fault. The best thing that you can do is to reach out to your sibling or to the other person in this situation and explain what you've learned and see if you can work something out. If you can't, just move forward and try to do the best you can from here on out. The good news is that in certain ways this could actually work to your benefit because you could end up really bonding with your sibling over this shared negative experience and you could sort of rebuild the family that you no longer have as a result of it. Number three, sometimes you feel like there's more going on than should be going on with your parent. Like when you were growing up, you might have often had to act as your parent's caregiver or their partner when really they should have been acting as your caregiver. The thing is not all narcissists grab the spotlight with their sparkly personalities. Some of them get it by playing the victim role and acting like their problems are the worst, acting like they can't function because of how terrible their lives are. On a side note, this also leads those of us who were raised by narcissists to come on out and go, everything's cool, to not complain at all, in some cases even when we should. Narcissists have this way of trying to control other people in whatever way seems to work for them. And if in the past they've done this by threatening to hurt themselves or by acting like they're going to die, guess what they're going to do? They're going to keep playing that stuff over and over again. You, if you had a parent like this, this type of narcissist, you might have felt like your whole entire childhood was spent saving your parent, putting out fires and maintaining the peace in the house. You might have been the peace maker between your parents or between your parent and your other sibling or your parents and everybody else in the world. It's a burden. Some of my male clients have said to me that they had to act sort of like their mother's husbands almost, especially when their fathers died and vice versa for my female clients acting like their father's wives or even their mother's wives while they were cooking and cleaning. They were doing all the housework. The boys had to sort of save their moms from the big light bulb. And I'm not going to lie to you. I asked my son to change the light bulbs. He's taller than me. But I'm not acting like my life's going to end if he doesn't do it. And I'm going to be really straight up with you. Sometimes it takes him three days. <laughs> Sometimes I just climb on a ladder and do it myself. But the point is, parents who are narcissists make their children feel like they have to take care of them sometimes if they're this type of narcissist. If it's not this type of narcissist, if it's more of the out there overt type of narcissist, then that parent might make the child feel scared because they're angry if they don't do what they want all the time. Some people feel like it was their job to keep their father or their mother 
scared from getting angry at the family. It's really all about that sense of drama that as a kid you thought you had to keep everything calm and managed in the home. That's a sign. So how do you deal with this one? Well, this one is a big deal, but I've actually made videos about it. Check out my videos on inner child healing. That's really what's important here. You want to take the time to manage that. You want to acknowledge that inner child within yourself. Ask them what they need. Ask them what they needed that they didn't get. What do they still need that they didn't get? Acknowledge the emotional needs of yourself and that child that you once were. Acknowledge that those needs were not met by your parents. Number four, you base your value on whether or not your parent or your or some person in your life thinks you're doing the right stuff. Or you have certain performance-based objectives in your life. Maybe you became a doctor because that's what your mother wanted. Or maybe you didn't become a doctor and because of that, you think you're not good enough because your father always said to you that you should be a doctor. Maybe you have feel like you have to always be on or you have to be performing or you have to be the family advocate or whatever. You may or may not have low self-esteem, but chances are that you might, even if you don't realize it. You might be a workaholic because work is the only thing that ever gave you any sort of reward. I'm a little bit of a workaholic and maybe that's because I get validation from my work. When you learn something that you can produce and share with the world, a lot of times you completely dig into that. You become a little bit more detached, a little bit more self-contained than your parent in this effort to achieve. So chances are you're either going to be a high achiever or you're going to say, I'm not good enough and so I'm not going to try at all. Number five, another way you can tell that you have been raised by a narcissist is that you don't have a really strong sense of yourself. What do I mean by that? Well, maybe you found yourself in a career that you didn't really choose. You kind of just fell into it. Maybe you felt like you never really were sure what you wanted in your life. And maybe you felt like you were supposed to grow up and be what your parents told you to be or what your mother or father was because that's what they told you was the right thing to do. Maybe you felt like you had to jump into the family business or something like that. There's a theory that might explain everything, including the way narcissists behave in relationships as well as how you fit into all of this. It's called attachment theory. Attachment is defined as a deep and enduring emotional bond that connects one person to another person. Attachment theory basically helps us to understand our relationships and how our relationships with our mothers could affect us and our lifelong development and even our relationships with others in really profound ways. In psychology, attachment theory as we know it today was first originated in 1958 when psychiatrist John Bowlby recognized the importance of a child's relationship with their mother. It turns out he realized that our emotional, social, and cognitive development are directly affected by our attachment to our mothers. Now, along with fellow researcher James Robertson, Bowlby found that children who were separated from their mothers would experience extreme distress. This would lead them to anxiety, and they assumed that this might have been related to the idea that their mothers fed and cared for them. But then they noticed that the separation anxiety would not diminish even when the kids were fed and cared for by other caregivers. Now, before this, the reason they thought this was because other researchers had sort of underestimated the bond between the child and the mother and assumed that the feeding of the infant was the thing that bonded the mother and the child. Well, Bowlby was the first to propose that attachment might be an evolutionary thing, as in the child's caregiver is obviously the person who provides the child with safety, security, and food. So he thought being attached to the mother would increase a baby's chance of survival. Makes total sense to me. How about you? Now, if you are interested in learning more about attachment theory specifically, you can check out the links I'm going to leave for you in the description below, but I'm going to fill you in on what you need to know right now when it comes to dealing with a narcissist and what the attachment styles are. Speaking of which, what are the four attachment styles? Well, there are four primary attachment styles, like I said, including secure, anxious, preoccupied, dismissive, avoidant, and fearful avoidant, though there are some subtypes that have been identified. But for today, we're going to focus on just the four main attachment styles, which for the record, sort of explain why families tend to see generations of healthy or unhealthy relationships repeating and why it's so important for those of us who have grown up with toxic parents to intentionally change our own lives so that our children, if we do have any, can do better than we did in the future. We can change the generational curse, so to speak. So first we're going to talk about secure attachment style. The secure attachment style is probably, if we're being honest, the most desirable one. It is where you feel comfortable and you feel connected to the person you're in a relationship with and where you trust them and you trust the integrity of the relationship. Basically, you feel secure in the relationship. Now people who have this style of attachment 
probably grew up with healthy relationships with their parents. And they also felt secure enough in those relationships to explore the world and other people in it. They felt loved and supported in childhood. This helped those people grow up feeling safe to involve themselves in a variety of situations and activities, knowing that they could still always go home and get support and love from their parents. And their parents were likely also securely attached to their own parents. So this healthy pattern would continue through to the next generation. Good stuff, right? So that's ideal. But then there's the anxious, preoccupied attachment style. If you've ever met a hopeless romantic, you may have been talking to someone who had the anxious, preoccupied style. This person desperately wants to be connected to others. They crave the emotional intimacy that comes along with relationships. The only problem is that this person also has this idea that they want to jump ahead in the game, even if their partner's not ready for it. So they're likely to say, I love you a little too quickly, and they might push ahead in the relationship even when there are red flags everywhere. They need constant approval and they need reassurance from their partners. They feel anxious if they don't get those things and they doubt their self-worth probably because they need others to validate them. And when their sort of clingy behavior pushes away their partners, well, they might feel like they were right all along, as in maybe they really are worthless. They have a positive opinion of people around them, their peers, but not so much of themselves. Now these people's parents may have intermittently met their needs, as in they were loved and cared for, but not on a consistent predictable basis. Interestingly enough, this kind of person develops when their parent seems to need the child to meet their own emotional needs. So their mother might have been the type that thought to herself, well, nobody loves me, but if I have a baby, at least I'll have someone to love me. It doesn't work that way, but once again, you can see exactly how this might carry on throughout the generations. This brings me to the dismissive avoidant attachment style. This is where you might actually find a narcissist. Someone with a dismissive avoidant attachment style certainly appears to be emotionally independent and is likely often a little bit afraid of committing to a relationship with a single person long term. So they have commitment issues, right? They would have had parents who were either not around a lot or were negligent in their care in other ways. They might have been ignored or abandoned or undervalued in childhood. They felt rejected. They felt not good enough. They felt unwanted. And one or both parents might have been completely absent for this person. Their needs may have been partially served, but not fully. For example, maybe they got plenty of food and they were bathed on a regular basis. They had clean clothes, but nobody held them, or at least not often enough. They might also have been rejected by their peers as they got older, and they might have lived their lives feeling just not good enough entirely. This would leave them afraid to trust people in general, and as a result, they might be really likely to be dismissive of other people. They tend to cover up their insecurity with a sort of false sense of self-confidence. But when someone is dismissive avoidant and they manage to find a secure, loving relationship and they take the time to work through their own issues, well, they actually can manage to have healthy relationships. But unfortunately for most narcissists, they don't develop the emotional maturity to do that and they stay stuck in that attachment style. Let's talk about the fearful avoidant attachment style. Now this person, they might always be dating the wrong people for them. And on the flip side, they might also end up rejecting people who might be a really great fit for them. It's kind of an interesting thing. They might find themselves feeling kind of normal in unhealthy relationships where they feel the need to earn the other person's approval. And they feel scared or they feel threatened when something seems too good to be true or when things are going toward a bigger commitment like marriage. This person's attachment style might lead them to actually sabotage a really good relationship in some cases, maybe because they are afraid it will end and it might leave them feeling devastated. They struggle with jealousy and with distrust in relationships, even when it isn't warranted. This person probably grew up with parents who made it really clear that they were either unwanted or that they were not acceptable as they were. They can sort of be like a walking conundrum. They desperately want emotional intimacy, but they also push it away. They want to be in a committed relationship with the right person. They actively seek out the opposite or they avoid relationships altogether out of a fear of straight up rejection. Now, psychologists say that this kind of attachment style can be kind of a combination of the dismissive avoidant and the anxious preoccupied attachment styles. They also say that it's a result of dealing with a lot of trauma or loss in childhood. Like the dismissive avoidant, the parents of this person may have been unable to fully meet their needs in infancy. They may have always, for example, been fed enough and wearing a clean diaper, but maybe they weren't held or interacted with enough, for example. They might also find themselves having really difficult relationships with their parents, or they might even become completely estranged from them in adulthood, as in no contact. 
Their parents may have been alcoholics or addicts or narcissists, and they may have been physically and or emotionally abused. Now, which attachment style is yours? Let's talk about it. You personally might have any of these attachment styles and you still could end up dealing with a narcissist. But those of us who end up in longer term relationships with toxic people, well, we're most likely to fall into either the anxious, preoccupied or the fearful avoidant attachment styles. Now, if you have an anxious attachment style, you're going to find yourself completely bowled over by a narcissist. And that's because you might tend to have high anxiety responses to their behavior. Just think about it. If you have the anxious attachment style, well, then you're also going to have a tendency to be sort of emotionally hungry. If you get my drift, you might find yourself holding on to the idea of being deeply bonded with someone else, even when it's just a fantasy and not reality in your relationships. What I mean is that you might sort of self invent a bond or you might experience a trauma bond, but the bond that I'm talking about, your partner won't feel at the same time. And that's probably partially because of how you were not nurtured enough growing up. And you probably had at least one parent who didn't give you the love and the nurturing that you really needed as an infant. You've dealt with a lot of turbulence in your life and you might have felt unloved or unwanted. So you might have a tendency to latch on and hold on for dear life when someone does show some kind of love for you. Now, narcissists will see this in you and they'll sense this. And that's why you become vulnerable to them because they know how anxious you become. And that alone gives them the narcissistic supply that they need, which is why they see you as the perfect prey in a way. Since narcissists are known to have the avoidant attachment style, they can be relatively abusive, as you know, and they will always find faults in you. They will place blame on you since some people with the avoidant attachment style can't take responsibility for their behavior. The more they do this, the more you become anxiety ridden and your bond with them will disappear if the vicious cycle keeps going. But the bond was never real to begin with. Let's talk about which attachment style the narcissist represents, shall we? As I mentioned earlier, while technically a narcissist might classify themselves under any of these categories, they're most typically identified as the dismissive avoidant attachment style, which is why they maintain a certain distance when it comes to their relationships and why they make you feel like you're unwanted or unneeded, even if they clearly depend on you completely for narcissistic supply and well, anything else. The dismissive avoidance style leads to being overly self-reliant or appearing to be that way and downplaying the importance of relationships. But they're quite vulnerable when it comes to a big crisis because they don't handle a crisis very well. Now they may have a super inflated opinion of themselves and they can be very critical and suspicious of other people, which makes their relationships pretty miserable for anyone involved. Now this is where you're going to find the overt narcissist or the more kind of in your face narcissist anyway. But the covert narcissist can actually fall into the avoidant fearful style which seems a little counterintuitive since their victims can also fall into this category. So let's talk about the wild card attachment style, which is fearful avoidant. Many people who could be classified as codependent might fall into the fearful avoidant attachment style. As adults, fearful avoidant types might become overly dependent on their relationships. While they might have had similar experiences in childhood, the difference between whether someone becomes a narcissist or a more empathic type of codependent would depend on how they deal with their own childhood experience when they are the fearful avoidant type. In either case, those who could be classified as fearful avoidant, they tend to be absolutely terrified of rejection and they are constantly dealing with inner conflict. They sometimes thrive on drama and they are nearly always suffering from low self-esteem. They are definitely prone to anxiety when it comes to relationships, whether they're super clingy or they're constantly avoiding intimacy. So how is it that a codependent people pleaser could potentially fall into the same category as a covert narcissist? Well, it is the codependency factor. Both narcissists and their victims could be, according to psychologists, considered codependent because at its most basic level, codependency represents someone who has sort of lost themselves or never found it in the first place. Let's talk about the lost self in all of this. In other words, a codependent person has no connection to their innate self or they've lost it if they had it before. Rather, probably due to being raised by toxic parents, they've learned to base their lives as in their thinking and their behavior around someone or something else outside of themselves. Now this could be a person or a process or even a substance. 
For narcissists, the lack of connection to their true self can then lead to a connection with a sort of made up self or an ideal self, the mask that we often talk about with narcissists wearing. In contrast, a people pleaser might find their identity in getting approval from other people instead, or they might at least find value in themselves in this way, otherwise they feel worthless. Interestingly enough, narcissists in general are also thought to be emotionally immature. Like I've said before, they tend to be emotional toddlers, right? That's because when an infant is cared for by its mother, it does not think about the mother's needs at all, and that's very normal. It's expected. Most people do start to develop this awareness of the needs or feelings of other people on at least a basic level by the age of two or three. Now, narcissists, they never develop it fully. So in some cases, even people who had really attentive parents can become narcissists, especially when their parents did not actively teach them empathy. Not everyone thinks of that. So what does all this mean? Are you just doomed to a life of miserable relationships if you don't have the secure attachment style? Well, I've got a little hope for you. As someone who's gone through narcissistic abuse, you'll be thrilled to know that there's something called earned secure attachment. That is good news because there is hope for you yet. Like I've been telling you for years, it is possible to heal from narcissistic abuse and to create the life that you want. And studies confirm this, telling us that with intentional healing and focusing on creating the life that you want, you actually can develop something called earned secure attachment. At its most basic level, that means that you can sort of build a new attachment style that is healthier and better for you on every level. So in other words, it means you've done the work, you've managed to deal with and heal from any dysfunctional parenting or trauma you had growing up. Even better, you can do this at any age. Yeah, it's about taking the time to understand sort of where you came from and working to rewrite your story in the process. I have talked about this in great detail, so if you are interested in learning more about this, now if your mother is a narcissist, you might like to know about my Adult Children of Narcissism support group, which you can learn more about and join for free at queenbeing.com slash A-C-O-N. Acon for adult children of narcissists. Additionally, take a look at the playlist I'm leaving for you right here, which can help you to heal and start to really take back yourself in ways that maybe you weren't even aware of before. Please remember that you matter. Your feelings, your thoughts, your ideas are valid and worthy of expressing, worthy of hearing. And please remember that you're not alone. This brings me to the question of the day. And the question of the day is, were you raised by a narcissistic mother? And if so, could you relate to any of the points I made today? And what would you add to my list? Share your thoughts, share your ideas, share your experiences in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. As always, thank you so much for being a part of my day and a part of my life, and hey, thanks for letting me be a part of yours. It really does mean a lot to me. Now, before I go, please make sure that you take a look at the videos I'm leaving for you here and here, and while you're at it, hit the subscribe button so we can stay connected and continue on this healing journey together. I'll see you soon.